Hi, I'm Lindsay Johnson. I'm the Fiscal Sponsorship and Communications Manager at Southeast Uplift. Thank you for joining us today. I want to mention that we do have a few more trainings coming up. We have one tomorrow on managing volunteers, uh, one next week on event planning, and then some more in April and May on meeting facilitation skills, decision-making models, and taxes. So this Insurance 101 session will be presented by Matt Loken from Bliss Sequoia Insurance and Risk Advisors. This session is being recorded and will be shared. You're welcome to have your camera on or off, whatever is most comfortable for you. We have enabled captions, and if you have additional access needs, feel free to post those in the chat for me. Matt comes to us very highly recommended by NAO, the Nonprofit Association of Oregon. And I am going to hand the mic over to our presenter, Matt, to introduce himself. Thank you for being here. Great. Well, thanks for having me and appreciate everybody jumping on and taking the time to learn about insurance. Um, understandably, it's usually not everybody's favorite topic, but it's very important as, as you start uh, getting out there and, and creating risk for the organization, trying to do good things in your, your areas of, of service. So um, with that, uh, I'll go ahead and just walk you through some information here that Lindsay can provide to anybody who wants a copy of this. Um, it's just a couple pages, but it's going to touch on a lot of the highlights, um, things that you uh, want to be considering and thinking about to create questions. So when you're looking for your own insurance coverages, depending on your circumstance, you know what right questions to ask in order to really hone in on the coverage that is best placed for your organization or for your service needs. So the, the first bullet point here is just letting you know, hey, I'm, I'm Matt Loken. Um, I'm a partner at Bliss Sequoia Insurance and also a CIC, which is next level, level certification in the, in the insurance space. It's a certified insurance counselor. Um, so that keeps me up, up, to, up to speed on different things that are happening for, for claims and, of course, the litigation side of things here and what's really happening out there. Um, our agency has a focus in the nonprofit space, which is where the Nonprofit Association of Oregon comes into play. And uh, as an example here with our specialization and partnership with NAO, um, I'm the program administrator and agent for the directors and officers program that was put together during the recession. And the program's been in place ever since, uh, and it's, it's built for the, the longevity of it. Um, now, with that, going to read this verbatim here, but this is a, a market update that, again, everybody can get access to. So over about the last oh, year and a half to two years, we've been receiving in the insurance world, just really we're being inundated by articles and updates with what's going on with the economy and how that's impacting the insurance market. And I, I wish I had better news for the group, but unfortunately, this is not what you want to hear. This is going to tell you why your home, your auto, your business insurance is going up. And it gives you the whole breakdown of all the different variables coming into play. So in general, what the economists and, and historians are saying is we're likely in the worst insurance market of all time. And so uh, buckle up a little bit for a year or two, because that's probably how much longer we have before things kind of, uh, you know, let's hope they plateau out or get better and we start seeing rates actually drop. So again, without being too wordy on this, because I want to have plenty of time for everybody with, with questions and actually get into the coverages, but this is a, a universal explanation that really will apply to pretty much everything except for life and health insurances. It's really more tailored towards property and liability side. So I'll scroll to the next page here. And so uh, just kind of getting into some of the basics here, anytime you're going to be looking for your coverages, um, we refer to it as marketing considerations. So the first thing is the three P's, people, program, and property. What are you doing and who's doing it? Is it employee-based? Is it volunteer-based? Uh, program being, of course, what kind of services are you providing? Are you working with people with disabilities, elderly, children, those kinds of things that'll come into play? Um, are you working with the general public? Um, are you doing entertainment? So maybe you might be putting on a festival in the park, something like that. All these different variables in the nonprofit space, A through Z, makes a pretty broad stroke of what you might be doing. So a lot of times as you're going through underwriting processes, you'll get some applications coming across your desk that are incredibly broad. And they're, the insurance company is doing that intentionally. They're trying to 
essentially hone out or excuse me, hone in on what you are doing, but also rule out all the other things that you might be doing because you may not be a YMCA, you may not have summer camps, you may not have a lake on site or a swimming pool. You might not have overnight uh, residential services that you provide to, provide to people with disabilities, all these different things. And then they'll hone in on what it is that you do. So if you're going through the paperwork, do understand that there, there really is a method to the madness of the insurance companies because the potential of what you're doing in, as a nonprofit's huge. So, <laughs> um, and then of course, if you have any real property, vehicles, uh, brick and mortar buildings, those kinds of things, you want to take those into account as well. And then, of course, you want to take into account loss control. So anytime you're thinking about a liability, think about the risk that the insurance company is putting on, on the line for you. And typically what you're talking about is at least a million dollar liability policy to go ahead and take care of any type of a situation you come into play with that is covered by the liability policy you purchase. So uh, uh, one of the things that a lot of people don't really understand is that insurance, of course, when you hear about liability, it's got a limit of liability and it's, it's bought in million dollar increments. And it also includes the legal defense portion of a policy for you. So if you've got a general liability policy, primarily people think of it as your trip and fall coverage. It's going to cover bodily injury or property damage to someone or something else. There's some other coverages that come into play, but for this example, if someone gets hurt at one of your events and oops, they tripped over your tripping hazard, the insurance company is not just gonna pay for their medical bills to try and get them medically stable again, but um, they'll also provide an attorney if they're coming after you with pain and suffering and some other claims through a lawsuit. So the insurance company, since they've got at least a million dollars on the line, they're going to go ahead and bring in the best attorney that they would have on retainer that specializes in that type of law. So there's a big benefit and a, a, a real um, help you sleep better type of a, a thought that you've got someone who really knows what they're doing to protect the organization, the mission, the assets to keep you uh, providing those services going forward in the event of a lawsuit. Uh, next coverage, of course, is going to be jumping into your, your or next consideration is going to be jumping into claims. So uh, claims is always going to impact the insurance arena and um, trying to mitigate those claims with proper loss control safety protocol is definitely going to be your best bet. A lot of the insurance companies that you access in the nonprofit world, they've got a really uh, rich uh, library of information, resources and tools at your fingertips. Most of the time they're at no cost. They just come with your, your policy for whatever type of coverage you have. So maximizing those is definitely in your best bet. And then utilizing the proper insurance company and insurance agency. Once you get into certain types of insurance, nonprofit insurance being one of them, it gets pretty specialized. And so just the simple analogy, and I'm sure you've heard this about other industries, but if you're looking for, um, you, you need heart surgery, you're not going to go to a general practitioner. You're going to find somebody that specializes. That's true in really any financial type of a, a business like insurance and, and others that are out there legal. So you want the expertise and, and financial stability that will come with those professionals helping you. And then the last thing is insurable interest. And so with that, some, some entities, neighborhoods um, are actually covered under the Southeast Uplift Insurance Portfolio. Um, others on this on this call, um, you're probably just trying to find out how the insurance might work. And so again, I'm just going to try and help you come up with some questions to figure out really what the avenue is to make sure you've got the insurance that's appropriate for the type of program that you're putting out there. So um, with that, if anybody has any questions, I'm okay with being a talking head. I, I do it all the time. But if if you do want me to just break where I'm at and ask questions as they come up, I actually prefer that so that uh, we can kind of just go down those rabbit holes and have more of a conversation than really just me talking. So if anybody has anything, please just fire away. So um, next here is just jumping into some typical things that you might see with a nonprofit insurance portfolio. And I'm going to go one by one through these and just kind of give you an idea what the coverages would be. And then you could just basically make a, a little mental note or uh, take, a, take a note there if you have some paper in front of you to look into these different coverages if you think they're applicable. So the first coverage is just property. Again, do you have anything tangible that you need to insure? Do you have marketing materials? Do you have an office space? Uh, again, do you have a building? Those kinds of things. And that's where the property would come into play. 
Um, property is just about always going to be the most cost effective insurance that's out there. Um, and that's, you just think about it. There's really no attorneys involved. It's pretty cut and dry. There's not lawsuits that might come into play. Um, right now, uh, because of the market that we're in, uh, we've still got inflation going on when it comes to property values, just getting contractors on site can be kind of difficult. So the cost of materials, everything has gone up. So the cost of insurance has gone up a little bit for the property as well, keeping in line with those property values as they go up. But still, if you've got property, it's worth taking a look at and getting the coverage. There's another aspect of property coverage that a lot of people don't realize is there. And it's actually uh, covers, it's called business income and extra expense. So if you are gonna be putting on uh, maybe a fundraiser for your program and you've got all, maybe you're gonna do an auction type of a situation and you've got all the donated items located in a storage unit at your office, uh, could even be maybe a board member's home. And that's when the worst case scenario happens. And let's say there's a big fire and everything is lost all at once. And it's the week before the auction. It's kind of like, you know, everything goes crazy. So if you've got property coverage and you also have business income extra expense included within that property coverage, um, you can actually have some recourse through your property policy to pay for your lost revenues. So on paper, it's as if you didn't lose everything and you actually had your auction and that you realized all those profits from your auction to help with your mission. So um, that's, again, just one of those things to keep in mind. That's where uh, a lot of nonprofits don't realize that that's a huge benefit to a property policy. And they step over a dollar to pick up a dime and don't add property to their coverage. When in the big picture of things, it, it, it's really inexpensive and it makes sense to safeguard your, your, your budget, safeguard your, your uh, potential income from your fundraisers and other activities that you might have going on. Um, crime coverage. The crime coverage here is not as if someone breaks in and steals your property from you. Instead, the crime coverage here is in reference to employee or volunteer theft of goods um, and also of your money. So this is one of those where um, if you're going to be going after grants, going after contracts for services, those kinds of things, very commonly, whoever the grantor is or the contract holder, they're actually going to require that you have some form of employee dishonesty or em employee theft, which is part of the crime coverage here, as part of your insurance portfolio to protect the money that they're putting into your program. And so we're starting to see that become very common. So one of my recommendations is that if you are going to be going after any grants, any contracts for services, that you do run that by your insurance professional, your insurance agent, and just make sure on the front end, as you're actually writing, uh, you know, doing the, the, the grant submission or the contract submission, that you're taking into account potential additional costs of insurance. And crime, employee dishonesty, is the first one in, in this list that could potentially be part of that for you. Uh, usually what I recommend is our agency best practice is that you start at a hundred thousand dollar limit and then you go up from there. And for a lot of organizations, especially as you're getting started, that sounds just nuts. Why would we need a hundred thousand dollars in coverage? We don't even have that. We might have a, a five thousand dollar total budget for the year. The, the idea behind this, it's a cumulative on how the, the coverage comes into play. And if you know, no one's really going to steal $100,000 right out of the gate and run for the border, if you will. That, that doesn't happen. What happens is somebody over a longer period of time is actually stealing from the organization, whether again, money or materials. And if it's over years, sometimes even decades, it can add up to be a really large amount of money that they've stolen. So that, that's one part of this claim process is that you want to get basically recouped through your insurance policy for those revenues that were stolen or product that was stolen. The other part that comes with this one, unfortunately, is usually it's a very trusted employee or a very trusted volunteer that's been actually stealing from the organization. So it also pulls on heartstrings, unfortunately, which makes it one of the hardest claims to go through is that that trust has been violated. So hopefully you never have to worry about it, but you do need to know about it. And eventually you might have to have it as part of your insurance portfolio. Um, the next coverage here is actually surprisingly inexpensive. So accident medical coverage, it can cover employees, volunteers, and program participants. 
So an easy example is maybe you're going to be putting on um, some um, area cleanup parties and you're getting a bunch of volunteers together to go clean up the park, whatever the case might be. And you just want to make sure while everybody's out there, they're doing the raking, picking things up and, and doing the cleanup project itself. If someone stepped off the curb and they broke their ankle during their volunteer period, they're volunteering at the time when they got hurt. This would be a policy that you can actually trigger to pay for that, say, broken ankle that they might have sustained. So it's a nice way to uh, help as a Good Samaritan type of a, a, a deal as your organization, but also it can be used as a way to try and head off any type of an injury from becoming a legal concern to the organization. So you say, hey, let us pay for that broken ankle. And by the way, please don't sue us on the back end. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that they won't or can't, but it is a nice benefit. And that's one of the, the nice safeguards you can put in place to protect the organization. Again, with the individual in mind, but also the big picture in mind, because you want to avoid those million dollar cases against you if you can. Um, you can buy different limits of coverage there. So you can keep the cost really low, maybe a hundred or excuse me, $300 per year is kind of an average you'd see for maybe a $20,000 medical limit for someone again, breaking their ankle, something like that. But you can also buy a hundred thousand or more in coverage and it'll vary based on the type of activities that you're doing, how many people that you're insuring, but you'd be surprised if you get a quote, it's pretty inexpensive, usually just a few hundred dollars. Uh, next coverage here, we're getting into the general liability and I mentioned this one as your trip and fall, bodily injury, property damage type of coverage. And with this one, again, very common, almost 100% of the time, if you're going after a grant or contract for services, you will see this one as a requirement. And so one of the other pieces of the puzzle that comes into play with this one is it also covers for things like libel and slander. It's called personal injury under this coverage. And you might have a volunteer that says something bad about another organization that might be doing work in the area. And of course it gets back to that other organization and here they come filing a lawsuit that you've tarnished their reputation and ability to actually provide services. And they claim that they have financial burden based on their tarnished reputation. And here comes that lawsuit. Um, they don't happen too much. Usually they'll send you a cease and desist letter and that'll be the end of it. But if it's someone who's litigious or if it's uh, maybe some, something pretty bad and they actually are financially burdened by what was being said, um, it'll trigger the coverage for you. Uh, another aspect of this coverage as well is that it, it actually covers frivolous lawsuits. So you might have somebody or maybe uh, you've got the, the park cleanup project, like I mentioned. And uh, just a member of the public is walking by and they say that they tripped over maybe a rake that's laying on the ground, but no one saw it. And this person maybe had injured themselves the day or two before, and they were just trying to take advantage of the situation and blame you for it. So they can, you know, they're seeing dollar signs in their eyes. They're going to bring a lawsuit. Well, the insurance company, they're looking at that as, well, it's a bodily injury type of a claim against you. So they'll go ahead and tender legal defense. And then at that point, hopefully through discovery, the attorney can do their job and say, this is frivolous, go away. Uh, sometimes what the insurance company will do is they can't prove that, but they will make them go away by having a settlement with that party. And, you know, they might give them $2,500, $5,000, whatever the case might be, just to make them go away. Um, that's one of the parts of insurance that I will tell you is extremely frustrating is sometimes the insurance company is gonna look at the big picture of what's going on and they'll cut to the chase. They know it's gonna be cheaper and less stress on you if they just settle and move on. Granted, it's a claim against you, so there'll be repercussions for a few years having that claim on your record, but the insurance companies know what they're doing and they, they do kind of steer the ship, if you will, when it comes to claim settling in most situations. Um, when you're looking at liability policies, some of the common terminology that you're going to see is an aggregate and also a per occurrence limit. So what's common in the nonprofit space for these aggregates and per occurrence limits is a $3 million aggregate, and this would be for liability policies, and a $1 million per occurrence. That's kind of pretty normal in, in the industry. And an aggregate, think of that as an insurance bank account that comes up to renew each policy year. So you get a $3 million bank account that you can pull $1 million out at a time. 
So the idea is if you have one big million dollar claim, there's still something in your bank account just in case there's another claim or two coming up the rest of the year. So you could have six $500,000 claims um, to get up to that $3 million. You could have three $1 million claims to get up to that $3 million aggregate. It, it's varied, but the idea is that you don't want to run out of your bank account. So just in case you've got something in reserve to protect the organization, the board, and the folks taking part in the, in the program. Uh, professional liability, this is covering you and, and just very basically, it's covering you for the services that you're putting out there. Anytime you put yourself out to the general public as having a, some kind of a additional knowledge over and above general pu public or how to do a service, that, that just simply creates a professional liability. That's about as simple as I can make it. Um, you might also know this term as errors and omissions coverage. So as an insurance agent, I have errors and omissions coverage, but I can also call it professional liability because I do things like this and I'm talking about my product. You're doing things like this, potentially educating and ad advocating for folks out there, but you're also probably providing some direct services. That's also professional liability as well. Um, the aggregate and the per occurrence at 3 million and 1 million, very common with what you'll see here for professional liability. And another one here that's a liability right below is abuse and molestation. And anytime you work with a vulnerable population, and this is true whether you're a for-profit or a nonprofit organization or company, anytime you work with a vulnerable population, think of kids, people with disabilities, the elderly, those are the common populations that get pulled into that. Um, there's others, but um, the definition keeps getting broader and broader as things change in our world. But that very quickly becomes your largest exposure if you do work with folks like that. And so um, think of uh, mentoring programs, think of um, Catholic Church, those kinds of things where we, we all hear about these stories on the news and massive lawsuits. So if you are going to work with vulnerable populations, you're, especially if you're going after grants or contracts, you're going to be required to carry that, that coverage. And it starts at a million dollars per claim. And sometimes you can get a $3 million aggregate. Sometimes you can only get a million dollar aggregate. And that's uh, oftentimes uh, dependent on the coverage requirements that you have in your contract or grant. And then you're also gonna be required to carry or have in place written policies that are proactive and reactive. If something were to happen and you did have an abuse situation or an allegation, what do we do? That's the reactive written policy. And then the proactive is, of course, what are you doing to keep everybody safe and above reproach to try and prevent having an abuse situation all the same? Uh, one of the wild cards that organizations take on, uh, uh, think, think about a, a, maybe a youth program. You're going to do a summer camp in the park and you're going to have kids there. One of the wild cards is you might have one of the kids doubt on one of the other kids while they're in your, your actual program, while you're in your camp. And that could just be one of the kiddos that is maybe has a bad home life and they, they act out on one of the other kids just doing what they think is normal. Well, if that happens within your program, unfortunately, you're going to end up owning exposure for that, the liability for that occurring. And so um, that's one of the things where most of the insurance companies out there, they will cover that it, it, you know, client on client interaction, but that's one of those things that you want to make sure is included. Um, that's not 100% true that everybody as an insurance company does include that. Um, you'll also want to be uh, conscientious about how legal defense impacts the limit of liability for abuse and molestation and for other coverages as well. So I keep mentioning the 3 million aggregate and the 1 million per occurrence. Well, if the insurance company is paying for the cost of your attorney in addition to awards and settlement at the end of the day, how, how does that work with your limit of liability? And the insurance world, the, the way we talk about it, the in, insider speak is it's either inside or outside of your limit, which is just another way of saying it's either part of your limit or it's in addition to your limit of liability. And the one that you want, if it's available, is in addition to the limit of liability. So if you've got a million dollars per claim for abuse and molestation and you end up having a, a, an actual situation where abuse did occur and you're going to have a, a legal defense bill by the insurance company, it could, it's one of the most expensive litigations out there is to fight an abuse claim. 
So if, if the insurance company is going to pay $250,000 for the legal defense bill, those billable hours to your attorney or attorneys, um, what will that do to the limit of liability? Will that diminish it down to 750,000 left? Or is that in addition to it and you still have your million dollar limit left over for awards and settlement? And of course you want it to be in addition or outside the limit of liability. That's best practice. It's not always available, but you wanna confirm that. Really helps stretch the dollar uh, for the organization and better your protections. Um, another consideration that can come into play, which is almost always the case with employee benefits, errors, and omissions, um, there's a coverage that's called claims made. And so claims made, if you can avoid it, avoid it, because you want an occurrence form. An occurrence form, once you buy it, it's in place as long as the insurance company is still in business. So if you buy a policy today and five, five years from now, here comes the abuse and molestation allegation against you, it'd be the coverage that was in place today that would actually trigger and provide legal defense, awards, and settlement for you. Claims made is very different. It would actually be the policy in place at the time the lawsuit is brought forward. I'm only going to very much snorkel on that topic, and I'm going to stop there. It's way more complicated, and I don't want to confuse anybody. Um, but if you can get a currents form, that's the takeaway. If you're going to hear anybody say claims made, ask questions and see if you can get an occurrence form instead of that. Um, employee benefits, errors, and omissions, that's the coverage that I mentioned usually comes as a claims made, and that's okay. That's pretty standard. Um, what the coverage does is if you have employees and your employees do have some kind of a employee benefit, whether health or retirement related, this is the coverage that will cover the organization for clerical errors that you might make that can have a negative impact on those benefits. So COBRA, by the way, is one of the coverages that can come into play on this one. Um, so even if you're not providing health uh, benefits or retirement like a 401k, it could still trigger for something like COBRA, continuation of benefits, which would be potentially connected with workers' compensation. If you don't have employees, don't worry about that one. It just doesn't come into play. Um, I'll, I'll stop here. Does anybody have any questions? Because I've just been kind of rolling here. If no one has any questions, I'll just keep on going. Okay, so I'll just keep rolling here. Um, so next coverage is automobile. And so a lot of organizations, as they're getting started, don't realize that automobile is probably one of your biggest exposures, if not your biggest, even though you don't really have a vehicle that's owned by the organization. You're going to have people periodically, whether employees or volunteers, that'll be driving on behalf of the organization, again, as part of their employment or part of their volunteerism. And they're on the clock when they're driving their personal vehicle, and that's when they get into an accident. So there's um, a coverage that's built into these policies that you can add to them. It's called non-owned and, and, uh, non and hired auto liability. The hired part, that's just rental insurance, so you can get the liability for rental cars. Usually you tandem these two together. The non-owned means that somebody's driving a vehicle that's not owned by the organization, but on behalf of the organization. They're, they're on the clock volunteering or, or as an employee. So it's, it's actually driven by state statute how these coverages come into play. So let's say you've got a volunteer that's running around and they're picking up supplies for a, a park cleanup project like I've been mentioning. And as they're running around, they accidentally run a, a, a maybe a stop sign or a red light and they T-bone another car and they put a few people in the hospital. So their personal auto insurance, that'll be first to go ahead and trigger and hopefully be enough to pay for the other party because you're going to have physical damage to their vehicle, but you're also going to have some medical expenses by putting some folks in the hospital. The worse the injuries, the more expensive it is. So if you're putting people in ICU, yeah, that's going to be an expensive claim, um, as you can imagine. So the, uh, let's say in this example here, let's say it's, it's all state, not picking on them at all, but just kind of using them as an example. But the, the employee or volunteer, let's say they've got a $300,000 personal auto liability limit with all state. So all state's going to jump in. They're going to pay that $300,000. Then this coverage, the non-owned auto liability lays over the top of theirs with an extra million dollars. So that means that in total, you've got $1.3 million to pay for the physical damage to the other vehicle, pay for medical bills to the other party, and then also potentially be providing an attorney and paying awards and settlements at the end of the day if there's a lawsuit. And oftentimes in today's world, 
there's a lawsuit. So it's pretty, pretty common stuff. So just think about, you know, rule large numbers, everybody in their life gets into an accident. It's really just, you know, were you at fault? How bad was the accident? Were people hurt? So having these higher limits in today's world as the cost of cars and the cost of medical keep going up, it's really important to have that one. And it's surprisingly inexpensive. So usually for a million dollar policy, uh, for, for smaller organizations, you're probably looking at around maybe $250 to $350 per year for a million dollar policy that covers folks. So kind of a no brainer in my opinion, but I know people don't like spending money on insurance if they don't have to, but that's, that's a big one. Um, umbrella is the next one. And in today's world, you might hear it as an excess policy. And an umbrella in today's world is just a tool we use to get you higher limits of liability that you might want or need by contract or grant. So you get to pick and choose under the umbrella the different liability coverages, whether general, professional, abuse, employee benefits, or auto. You can buy the umbrella in million dollar increments to get up to those higher limits per occurrence and per aggregate that you might need. So kind of kind of basic stuff, but important. A lot of people don't realize that it's it's really just that type of a mechanism in today's world. Uh, directors and officers, uh, that one pretty much everybody tends to know by name, especially if you've been around the nonprofit world for a while. But there's three coverages that are part of a directors and officers policy. The first one is actually called directors and officers. That will cover your board for decisions made or failed to be made that can have a negative impact on the organization mostly from a financial perspective, things like uh, misappropriation of funds if you get a grant and you don't use the dollars correctly. Um, those, those claims are actually surprisingly rare, um, but that's because you're mining your P's and Q's and making sure you're not doing that. Um, where most of the claims come from is the second coverage, which is employee benefit, or excuse me, employment practices liability. And that would be things like wrongful termination, harassment, retaliation. And most policies, and this is one of those things you want to make sure of and ask the question, does include volunteers by definition as an employee. So um, if uh, you have a, a group of volunteers that have been with the organization, here comes somebody from out of town, no one knows who they are, but their heart seems to be in the right place and they want to take part and help out. Well, it turns out they don't do well. They're kind of like oil and water with the rest of the volunteer group. Volunteer group is kind of pushing them out. And that person gets their feathers ruffled and says they were bullied out of the organization. That could trigger an employment practices claim and pay for the attorney and pay words and settlement if, if there was need for it. It also includes um, in a lot of cases, which again, question you want to ask, third party employment practices liability. So third party, we usually think employment practices is something internal that's happened and here comes a claim for, for those types of circumstances. Well, what if it's a volunteer that is maybe at the park cleanup project and they harass um, someone walking by, maybe it's a nice sunny day and uh, someone walks by wearing tight clothes and they make an inappropriate comment at them and here comes a sexual, uh, you know, sexual allegation and lawsuit against that volunteer but since they're your volunteer, you, you actually own their actions. And that's called third party employment practices for sexual harassment. Unfortunately, those things do happen and you never know uh, with your hopefully, you know, small armies of volunteers who might be there and what kind of a person they might be to make those kind of comments, but you, you own their actions. Um, the third coverage is called fiduciary liability and it's very specific. It's actually the flip side of the coin to employee benefits, errors, and omissions. So fiduciary, it covers the organizations uh, should you make decisions or fail to make decisions that have a negative impact on employee benefits, whether health or retirement related. So if you're 100% volunteer, it's really not a concern for you. Um, then you get into cyber privacy breach, and there's very few, if any, entity out there, whether for-profit or nonprofit, that in today's world doesn't have exposure you can be taken advantage of, open an email that you shouldn't, open an attachment that you shouldn't, uh, be tricked into giving your money away, those kinds of things that we hear about all the time on the news now. So cyber is becoming very common that it's required as part of a grant or a contract as well. So, um, and auto is also, I, I failed to mention that earlier, very common that you'll see it as a grant or a contract requirement. Uh, workers' compensation. So if you do have employees or you're planning to have employees as your organization grows its roots, um, 
uh, that's not a choice. So that's actually required that you do have workers' compensation. And if you're in the state of Oregon, which I imagine everybody online here is in, in the state, unless you're up in maybe Vancouver or whatever it might be, in the state of Oregon, we're really lucky that we have SAFE Corporation. So SAFE is a quasi-government entity. And so they actually have, uh, and, and nonprofit, if you will. So they've got a board that they adhere to, just like all of us here on the call. Well, not me, but everybody else. Um, so with that, they, they go about things very differently. And um, there's only a few of these entities out there all across the state. So again, we're really lucky to have them. But because they're mission driven, they keep their costs down and they provide a lot better service than other insurance companies out there. So I recommend uh, taking a look at them and uh, if, if you have the need. Otherwise, you can go to the Liberty Mutuals, Hartford's Travelers out there. But in my experience, Safe Corporation has just been the, the best place to go first and try and get qualified there. Um, unemployment is a real mystery. A lot of nonprofit organizations of all sizes don't know that you can actually opt out of paying the state unemployment tax. And it was actually a bill that was passed in the 70s. So what they were trying to do is figure out ways that you could basically channel more of your program dollars to your program versus other avenues that the for-profit world has to engage in. And unemployment was definitely a very smart one. It's just not been put out there very well from uh, really a sales perspective, an education perspective. So if you're a 501c3 nonprofit, a, a uh, quasi-government entity, like I mentioned, Safe Corporation being quasi-government, or your tribal, whether for-profit or nonprofit alike, you can actually opt out of paying the state unemployment tax. And uh, usually it starts to pencil out if you've got 10 employees or a million dollars in total payroll. But some organizations that are even smaller than that, they'll go ahead and opt out of paying the unemployment tax and just buy a, uh, an unemployment bond, which could just be a few hundred dollars per year. But you self-insure once you go that route. So, uh, you know, buyer beware, careful what you're doing. But again, I'm just trying to give you some things to ask on as you grow. Then the final one on, on the list here that I want to touch on is special events. So the policies up above here, these are annual policies. You, you have an effective date, say it's today, it would run for 365 days and then it would renew once again. Special event in some cases might be your best foot forward depending on what you're up to and what your budget is. So if you're gonna put on a, uh, maybe it's gonna be a, a festival and it's pretty vanilla with what you're doing, um, maybe it's just advocacy, uh, you know, some, some really, uh, mellow entertainment, nothing rock and roll rap, you know, those kinds of things that might get a little bit more rowdy. Sometimes a special event policy that just covers that window of time might be the most cost effective type of insurance for you. If you don't want to have coverage throughout the year, otherwise, a lot of the time you can actually incorporate whatever event that you're thinking about into these annual policies up above. But sometimes maybe your annual event that you put on, it's got a little more meat on the bone. You do have some exposures that, you know, it's a little more risky and you don't want to have that impact the rest of your insurance portfolio with your claim history reports. So that's another reason you might consider a special event policy is protect the rest of what you do throughout the year and just ensure that event under a special event policy. So if you have a claim there, it's not going to impact the rest of your insurance portfolio. So a couple, couple different thoughts there for you. Um, now, I know, again, I just threw a lot of information, and this is truly snorkeling. This is not scuba diving into the subject. Um, so if anybody has any questions, it's a great time for it. But here's my disclaimer down below that, you know, I wish we could go into these things a lot more, but I don't think anybody could stay awake long enough to get through it all. So if anybody has any questions, this would be the last time. Otherwise, I'll, I'll hand it back over to Lindsay and go from there. So we did have a question submitted in advance, which was, uh, what insurance would an organization need to run a music education program at public schools during school hours? Okay. So uh, most of the school districts have started requiring some coverages once you come on site and providing services. 
So if you're going to act on your own and be the organization coming in, providing those services, usually you're going to see, uh, of course, workers compensation. If you're an actual paid employee and they want to make sure if you get injured on the property that you've got that workers compensation as required by law, um, they'll require general liability. So if you cause bodily injury or property damage, you'll have the coverage there. Um, that's pretty basic stuff. If you're working with, again, a vulnerable population, so if we're talking about schools and it's kids under the age of majority, uh, abuse molestation is going to be required. And so with abuse molestation, again, you're going to have to underwrite that with your insurance company, have all the, the proper protocol, background checks, and those written policies in place. Um, then they'll also require the automobile um, coverage there. So if you get into an accident on site, oftentimes they'll require that as you're just Maybe you hit a pedestrian on, on property, those kinds of things. Um, and then there'll be a variant, a variance of the limits of coverage that they might require. Um, sometimes it's just based on the type of services that you're providing on, on school property. Um, One million per claim is pretty typical with a, maybe a two or a three million dollar aggregate. Um, and then Again, depending on what you do, sometimes they might require cyber, sometimes even directors and officers, but those are definitely outliers that you don't see too often. Um, the other avenue that I recommend, and again, this is for organizations that um, maybe you're, you're just getting started, and uh, I always like to say transfer risk where you can and try and save the organization potential liability, but also potentially save you money when it comes to insurance. So if you're going on to school property, uh, the worst they could say is no, is if you ask if you can actually be recognized as volunteers for those services of the school. So once they accept and get it in writing from the school district that yes, you are volunteers, then they protect you for those kinds of circumstances and you're, you're not going to have to take it on as an organization. And, and that's the best case scenario. Um, school districts don't always do that, but again, the worst they can say is no. So I, I think it's worth asking. Great. Thank you. And I'm also wondering for our organizations that are not 501c3s, but are registered as domestic nonprofit corporations, um, I guess what, what challenges or what hurdles might they encounter if they're viewed differently from 501c3s, but are registered as a domestic nonprofit. Yeah, yeah. So uh, if we're talking about new nonprofit organizations, that, that's going to be your first hurdle. So the insurance companies are going to want to make sure that as they're putting dollars into underwriting your quote for you, which is, is actually kind of surprisingly labor intensive for insurance companies to, to quote you even as a, a new small nonprofit. So they'll, they'll ask questions about your business plan, um, how you're going to finance your organization. They want to make sure that once they put those dollars in place, that you're you're doing your best to put your all your ducks in a row to be a success as a program. So that'll be the first thing is is making sure you've got that all in line. Um, they'll potentially even ask for the board members. So if we're talking about maybe a hundred percent volunteer organization, well, what's the experience of the board to provide that leadership to make sure this the success is there on the back end? Um, so that's that's one of those other avenues that you want to take a look into. Um, a lot of the insurance companies out there, um, a lot of them will write for-profit, non-profit, social human service programming. And so if you're you're not a 501c3, there, there are options out there for you. But there are some insurance companies out there. One of them is called Alliance of Nonprofits Insurance. Um, we call them Annie for short. Um, they do actually require that you're a 501c3. That's the way they're filed. So that's the, the, of course, the public benefit nonprofit organization, but there's plenty of different companies out there you can go to. And the insurance companies in the, in the social human service world, they, they all do have specialties. They don't write every type of a, an organization under the sun. Um, some of them are really good with, let's say, YMCA's, Boys and Girls Clubs. Some of them are really good with foundations. Um, some of them are really good with um, big residential programs that provide services to people with disabilities. So there's all these different variations. These are just a couple off the top of my head. But again, honing in on the, the best insurance company and making sure that you've got all your ducks in a row uh, going into the underwriting process is going to be important to, to make sure that you've got the, the right coverage. 
And then, like I mentioned before as well, is making sure you've got an insurance agent that, that really does have some experience and, and knows how to navigate these waters for you. Uh, that's, that's really important. Um, I couldn't stress that one enough. That's what, what brokers do. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, does anyone else have questions on the call? You guys are taking it easy on me. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I am wondering for really small volunteer led organizations, um, I mean, how much should they expect to pay for one or two insurance policies, you know, and which one should they really be prioritizing if they especially don't have staff, you know, um, are doing a limited number of activities? Yeah, yeah, actually, that's a really good point. So uh, usually what you'll see as a startup nonprofit organization, insurance is likely going to be one of the top expenses that you have as an organization getting rolling. And in great part, that's because insurance companies, they've got minimum premium thresholds. They, they have to charge X amount to provide the bare minimum of coverage at a million dollars per claim. They got to charge something for it, right? So that's, that's one of the reasons um, that you'll, you'll have the expense be probably your biggest, if not, not right up there at the top. And then as far as the bare minimum, usually what you'll see is you start with general liability and directors and officers, and uh, almost 100% of the time, those are going to be two separate policies, one uh, general liability, one directors and officers. And with general liability, that's part of either what you call a business owner's policy or a package policy. And that just depends on which insurance company you're going to and, and the size of the, the program that you're trying to insure and the insurance needs. But general liability for a, a, a either one of those policies is part of um, an overall package, if you will, an overall bundle of coverages like we all hear about on the on the commercials. And so general liability is the foundation. You start with that and then you add the other coverages on property, crime, general liability, professional liability, abuse and molestation, employee benefits, auto. Those are typically the coverages that you'll see that are part of those bundled policies or packages or business owner policies. Um, and then the standalones would be the accident medical in most cases is, is on its own. Some policies can incorporate it. Um, directors and officers on its own. Usually an umbrella is on its own. Cyber, workers comp, unemployment, special event. So, um, Again, general liability directors and officers. As a startup organization, you're probably looking on the low end of the threshold, maybe around $1,500 for those two. And maybe on, it can go up from there, of course, depending on what you're doing. But as a startup, small nonprofit with pretty basic uh, services, it might be up to $25 or $3,000 as well. Um, there's a lot of underwriting that goes into that, so please don't uh, put too much weight on those numbers, but it at least gives you an idea of what you can expect or budget for. Great, thank you. And I guess when it comes to special event, could you just recap? Um, so is that sort of a substitution for these other policies, or is that usually in addition? Yeah, yeah. So sometimes as I'm working with startup organizations or other agents out there working with startup organizations, there's just not the money to actually put in force a year round policy. So the special event policies can be supplemented um, into your insurance needs as a temporary fix. And um, I, I would let you know, anybody that's uh, on, on here now or listening later, special event policies shouldn't be 100% um, used forever for the organization. At some point, I do recommend that you try and get a, a year round policy in most circumstances. Um, but as you're getting started, you got to make some choices. And so sometimes a special event policy is the most cost effective way to still cover the event. You're just not covering all the ancillary things that you might be doing there um, as an organization throughout the year. And that's where you can run into some some issues with no insurance. Um, but at the same time, it, it's a really important tool to know that's in in, in the wheelhouse if you need it. Great, thank you so much. All right, last call for questions. Anyone out there? <laughs> and everyone, you've got my contact information. So if you didn't wanna say anything or you wanna reach out to me um, after the fact, feel free. Thank you so much, Matt, that's very generous. And thank you for joining us. Uh, we'll get this recording shared out to everyone who registered. And 
Have a wonderful evening. Okay. Thanks, everyone. All right. Thank you. Thank you.